Good morning. Welcome everyone. Dance, I mean. Great, so I see that we have um, 11 people here so far. That's great. Um, while we wait for people to join, um, I'm just gonna go over some housekeeping notes. So just uh, for French audio translation, you can click on Traduction Audio en Francais under session information. Um, for English closed captions, click on English caption, uh, captions also under session information. Um, if you require technical support, um, you can just go to live support at the top of your screen. Um, so if you need technical support at any point during the session today, uh, just look at the top of your screen um, and click contact live support. If you have any questions for um, myself or any of the presenters, um, you can submit your questions via the live Q&A box on the right side of your sque screen. Um, so all questions can go in that live Q&A box on the right side of your screen and, uh, and we will get to them. There's also going to be a Q&A um, time at the end of the session. So if we don't get to your questions right away, we'll get to them uh, at the end of the session during the Q&A time. Uh, the discussion forum on the right side of your screen can be used to share comments um, about the presentation, the topic, or just to say hi, um, or share like what your favorite kind of dessert is. I don't know <laughs> uh, how you're doing today. Um, there will be an evaluation at the end of the session, which will pop up on the right side of your of your screen um, under the poll section. Um, so when we move into Q and A at the end of the session um, or at the end of um, the presenters speaking, we will uh, there will be an evaluation poll that will pop up for you on the right side of your screen. Um, and so if you could, uh, I'll, I'll let you know when when that's happening as well. Um, but if everyone could please fill out the evaluation at the end of the session, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, yeah, and more information on the platform uh, can be found in the attendee FAQs um, available in the help section on the right uh, side of the event platform. I think those are pretty much all of the housekeeping notes um, that I have for you for now. Uh, again, if you need uh, technical support at any point during the session today, um, you can just go to the top of your screen uh, and, and press live on that live support uh, uh, button to get some support. Awesome. So, uh, great, I think we have about 28 people now. Um, that's awesome. Good morning, everybody. Great. Um, so welcome to um, our AAAW um, Aboriginal AIDS Awareness uh, Week event, Pathways to a Promising Future. Uh, my name is Sarah Martin Swapsu, um, and I'm the Promising Practices Coordinator with uh, the Canadian Aboriginal AIDS Network, CAN. Um, and I'm so excited to have you with us today um, in sharing this space uh, in this virtual platform that's new for us. Um, you know, I just started with CAN uh, this year in June, um, and I know these events often happen in person, um, and so uh, we appreciate your um, being here and joining us in this virtual space this year um, as we've adapted uh, and, and also <laughs> having patience with us um, as we, as we uh, navigate these virtual spaces. Um, so thank you for, thank you for coming. Um, Hi, hi. Um, so to start with, I just wanted to do an overview of the session today. Um, so first, we're going to have Elder Albert McLeod opening the session uh, in a good way. And then I will present on uh, four information sheets that can 
developed last year in 2019. Um, and the Wise Practices Info Sheets project uh, that I um, implemented this year uh, with three organizations nationally. Um, and I'll pre present on the Wise Practice recommendations from the Info Sheets, as well as some final findings from that project. And then I'll invite Brian from Prince Albert Métis Women's Association to answer some questions. Um, um, Prince Albert Métis Women's Association was one of the organizations that participated in the Info Sheets project this year. And then after, uh, after Brian speaks, um, I'll introduce Vanessa Anakudwabase Quay, um, who is uh, an, um, an Anishinaabe uh, sexual health educator um, who will share a, an activity or tool with us um, called Land is Body or Earth is Body. Um, so that's, that's the session for today. And, uh, and then after that, um, as I said, there will be an evaluation poll that will pop up. Um, and we appreciate it if everybody can fill out that evaluation at the end of the session. And then we'll move into a Q&A. So if anyone has any questions, um, they can feel free to put it uh, in that live uh, Q&A box, like I said before. And we'll answer it throughout the presentation. Um, and if we don't get to it throughout the presentation, we will answer it during the Q&A at the end. Um, so yeah, I think that's all. Um, so before I introduce Albert, um, I just want to acknowledge that um, I live in Winnipeg, Manitoba, um, and Manitoba, um, uh, Manitoba, it, you know, Indigenous people have had a relationship with this land um, for for thousands of years, forever, um, and Manitoba is the homeland of the Anishinaabe, um, the Inunu or Cree, uh, the Anishinaabe, Oji Cree, Dene, Dakota nations and peoples. Um, and this is also the heartland of the Métis Nation um, in Winnipeg, um, where, the, where the two rivers meet. Um, so uh, I just wanted to acknowledge that uh, before we get started. Um, we know that um, we know that acknowledging that the, the history of the land and, um, and, and the nations um, and the peoples that have had a relationship with the land that we're on um, or lands that we're visiting um, is important. Um, it challenges the colonial narrative. Um, and um, yeah, so, so I just wanted to say that before I, before I introduced Albert. Um, so next I'll introduce uh, Elder Albert McLeod, um, who's going to be opening for us today. Albert McLeod is a, is a status Indian with ancestry from, um, Albert, uh, I'm not sure how to say this. Um, could you pronounce the, the community and nation? Nisichewayasik, yeah, it's, it's pronounced Nisichewayasik. Nisichewayasik, Supposed Thank to meet you. where three rivers meet. Thank you. Um, so Albert McLeod is a status Indian with ancestry from Nisichewayasik, uh, Cree Nation, and the Métis community of Norway House in northern Manitoba. He has over 30 years of experience as a human rights activist and is one of the directors of the Two-Spirit People of Manitoba. Albert began his Two-Spirit advocacy in Winnipeg in 1986 and became an HIV AIDS activist in 1987. He was the director of the Manitoba Aboriginal AIDS Task Force from 1991 to 2001. In 2018, Albert received an honorary doctorate of laws from the University of Winnipeg. Albert lives in Winnipeg where he works as a consultant specializing in indigenous peoples, cultural reclamation and cross-cultural training. Um, thank you so much for being with us here today, Albert, and for opening our session. Thank you, Sarah, and uh, everyone who's joined us online to uh, begin this dialogue around promising practices. So as you can imagine, I've been involved uh, in the HIV response in Canada uh, for quite a while. Uh, my experience with HIV began in 1979 when I moved to uh, Vancouver from Winnipeg. And uh, while there, I met a, lot, uh, a large number of uh, two-spirit people, mostly uh, gay men who had done the same thing I had done 
in those days uh, migrated to sort of a gay cultural center, whether it was Montreal, Toronto, or Vancouver. Unbeknownst to uh, my peers at that time, uh, HIV, uh, infectious disease, had made its way into North America in larger centers like New York and San Francisco. And that eventually it did reach uh, Vancouver and was being transmitted uh, in those days uh, from the late 70s, you know, until, uh, you know, probably about 1984. And uh, people in those days were being diagnosed with AIDS, uh, like in New York and San Francisco, uh, young gay men who were at the end stage of HIV infection and were presenting with uh, uh, <clears throat> infectious diseases that young people would normally experience. And so that's when uh, the term AIDS was uh, coined and introduced in the conversations of that time. It was a very stigmatizing time, uh, an infectious disease, especially a new one uh, in the gay population, which itself was stigmatized uh, in the early 80s. Uh, there was still a lot of homophobia, transphobia. And so <clears throat> we experienced a lot of double or uh, for Indigenous people, triple stigma or uh, discrimination because of our uh, Indigenous identity. And so uh, in those days, you know, many of our colleagues uh, were hospitalized and uh, passed away from AIDS. And again, we were, uh, you know, uh, separated from our home communities, our families. Uh, it was difficult to even talk about what our experiences uh, were like in those days because people were uncomfortable with it. Uh, they felt, you know, even if you talked about AIDS, you were somehow implicated or uh, connected uh, to that. So there was a lot of, you know, um, separation that occurred. And a lot of these young people died without ever returning to their homes. Uh, many of their communities were not uh, responsive didn't want them to come home, especially in the end stage, or even after they died. And uh, we know of cases where there are still ashes of people who were cremated in Vancouver in large urban centers that no one ever claimed their ashes, ashes from their families. Uh, so we came through that period and, uh, you know, with the um, Federal government is their mandate to respond to infectious diseases. And it was an opportunity for uh, Two Spirit or Indigenous LGBTQ people to really, you know, uh, step up to the plate, which we did. Uh, you know, uh, from the 80s to the 90s, we were invited to uh, committee meetings, conferences by the federal and provincial governments to come up with responses to this HIV pandemic. And, uh, and we did, and uh, Dr. Jay Mortman was working for, with the Indigenous uh, Federal Department um, Medical Services Branch at the time. And his uh, objective was to work with the uh, First Nations Inuit MAT communities to come up with a response. And so in 1993, a national conference was held in Vancouver at the Hyatt Regency Hotel. And it was the second one, and it was the, sort of the larger one of the two that were held in that period. And that's when uh, we came together as a community, uh, two-spirit people, elders, people uh, living with HIV uh, as well as AIDS. And we began this work uh, quite early, and it was sort of before uh, the idea of uh, the Canadian Abrasion Ads Network uh, as a national response of Indigenous people. Some of those people in those days uh, were living with HIV and, uh, you know, had sort of, uh, you know, broken through the issue of stigma and discrimination to become public advocates around HIV, like Leonard Johnston, uh, Frederick Hainault, uh, Lee Chagita, who was an Inuit woman, Alex Archie, uh, Keisha Larkin, Dorlin McKay, Charlotte Brooks, Darcy Albert, uh, David Lees, and uh, they were kind of the ones who uh, led us, uh, you know, in the early years. And uh, there's many others that, you know, I can't name right now. But, uh, you know, just to acknowledge that uh, they were not afraid, you know, to step up, uh, to be counted. 
and to travel, you know, to get on a plane, fly to Toronto and check into a hotel, something that we normally wouldn't have experienced. We were experiencing these things. So we were overcoming our own uh, fears of, you know, navigating, you know, uh, national uh, entities like uh, Medical Services Branch, Health Canada, uh, and those kind of things. And, you know, sitting on committees and advising uh, professionals like doctors and scientists about the Indigenous perspectives uh, on HIV and AIDS. And then uh, 1994, uh, we began the idea of creating a national network. Initially, uh, it was centered around Indigenous people living with HIV and AIDS. And uh, we uh, uh, called it the Indigenous People Living with HIV and AIDS National Network. And uh, eventually it morphed by 1994 to 1997 into the Canadian Aboriginal AIDS Network, which were in those days called AIDS Service Organizations or ASOs. And these were the ones, Indigenous organizations that were funded uh, by the federal government to address HIV regionally, whether it was in the provincial sector or the territorial sector, uh, to uh, you know, do HIV awareness and prevention and outreach and develop specific resources. And uh, in those days, uh, one of our cultural leaders was uh, Dr. Myra Laramie, uh, who was part of the Two-Spirit community, kind of uh, helped us introduce uh, our spirituality into the work, whether it was traditional healing, traditional plant medicines, or traditional ceremonies. And that came a foundation of our work as a promising practice in terms of the response to HIV and has been ever since. Uh, in the 1993 conference in Vancouver, uh, Art Shafi, who is an elder from this region, actually had a, a healing circle of 200 attendees in that conference room. So those were, at the very beginning, our culture has always been part of our response. Uh, as well, in terms of the founding of CAN in 1997, uh, we've had Elder Paul Skanks, uh, who's from the East, has also been one of our elders at, at CAN who helped us with our work. Uh, one of the early projects in 1989 was funded in Northern Manitoba at the uh, 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 Cree Nation Tribal Health Council. And that was led by uh, Roger Prosek as a project coordinator and Helen Young from Opaskwak Cree Nation. Uh, and these are people who were uh, maintained the first HIV projects in Canada. Uh, today, uh, we know that, uh, 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 you know, in many ways, our response has prevented HIV uh, among Indigenous peoples in Canada. And uh, the Public Health Agency estimates there's about 6,100 Indigenous people diagnosed with HIV in Canada. Uh, even though we have increasing numbers in different parts of Canada, you know, we need to, you know, look at, you know, um, what role did we play as Indigenous people in, the, in keeping that number where it is, where now we know with the COVID pandemic and we can see how quickly uh, an infectious virus can spread, uh, uh, not just uh, globally, but in our own country and among Indigenous populations. So I think in many ways, uh, the work of community and promising practices has led to that number, uh, you know, and um, we don't really know the actual number because not all of the uh, ethnic identifiers are reported in Canada. So uh, at, a, at a minimum, we know there are 6,100 uh, cases of HIV in the Aboriginal population. In terms of promising practices, it's also been uh, creating a platform for people mostly affected by HIV, it's those who are living with HIV. And there's a national uh, sort of um, international uh, ideas about that. And it's uh, called GIPA, the greater involvement of people living with HIV, as well as the meaningful engagement of people living with HIV. And this is like in real time and that it not be a token process and uh, Randy Jackson uh, is one of those people who is now uh, a, a doctor, Randy Jackson, who uh, is one of the leads for the uh, FEAST project, which is a national HIV research program in Canada. Uh, 
So that is also a promising practice in terms of, you know, supporting and enabling uh, people living with HIV to become leaders in the response uh, to HIV. Uh, for two-spirit people, um, we began our work in 1988 at the first uh, international gathering of two-spirit people in Minneapolis. And that first gathering was really put together by uh, American Indian people who were seeing uh, the AIDS cases among uh, gay men in their communities. And uh, a group of us came from Winnipeg down to Minneapolis, the two-spirit community. And we began this work together uh, with our U.S. colleagues. And we continue to do this work with our U.S. colleagues who are experiencing the same type of historic trauma as well as racism and uh, the impact of colonization around infectious diseases like HIV. And uh, so our gathering has continued as a promising practice since then. This year was the 33rd gathering. And so what we did is we uh, began this process of decolonization, uh, reconciliation and indigenization in response to HIV as a way of health and wellness and healing and creating safe and safer spaces for two-spirit people in North America. And we continue to do that. Our gathering is held out outside of urban centers in nature uh, where we can have sweat lodges, where we bring elders, where we bring our youth. And we live as a healthy community, at least for four days out of the year, uh, as a, an example of reclaiming our identities as well as our healing uh, methods. So I'm very proud of that movement. It's one of the longest standing LGBT movements in North America that has been supported primarily through volunteership by local organizations across North America. We've traveled by plane, train, bicycle, airplane, beat up old cars to get to these places in the desert, in the mountains, in the north, in the south, the east and the west. So it stands today, you know, as one uh, of our, you know, responses to the seriousness of a global pandemic. And we continue many of uh, this generation of two-spirit youth are well educated about uh, preventing uh, HIV and sexually transmitted infections, about their identities uh, as Indigenous people, uh, and to be advocates for their uh, human uh, and inherent rights as Indigenous people on our lands. Um, also, Doris Peltier has been uh, one of the leaders for Indigenous women. And, uh, you know, Doris uh, began her work in theater. And there's always been, you know, uh, intersection of art uh, and the Canadian and Indigenous response to HIV and AIDS. And so it is the artists who also lend their voice to this work, another promising practice, because if you see a lot of this fabulous messaging, this fabulous posters that come out and, uh, you know, the, the traditional songs uh, and all of those that come out, it's coming from the artist community who also hold us up to do our work. Uh, and then now in the present, uh, we're working in Manitoba with a group of women uh, who are HIV positive. Uh, there's about 12 of them who are Indigenous, uh, as well as two-spirit and trans people. And they've called themselves the Sisters of Fire. And to me, that's such a powerful name in that fire, you know, can be healing. It can be warming, right? And uh, fire can also show us the way, give us light to see our path. And so I'm also very proud of these women who have stood up despite the stigma, despite the concerns about their privacy or their confidentiality. They've stepped forward and are, are not afraid of the stigma, you know, to reach out to other people who are diagnosed with HIV. And so uh, I just want to share that a little bit about my history. It's been 40 years for me, you know, and I think other people, they've experienced, you know, decades of doing this work in the front lines. And, uh, you know, we really have to take our hats off to them because it, for many of them, it is spending a lot of time away from their families, from their loved ones you know, traveling to conferences, uh, being present in other communities, traveling into the north on small airplanes, 
and those kind of things. We've done that, you know, for 30 years, uh, our community has been doing that, reaching out and educating people. And now with the success of the antiretroviral drugs, uh, people are alive today. You know, people who normally would have died 20 years ago are still alive, you know, having children, raising their grandchildren. Uh, and that's what this has been about. It has been about uh, living and life. And so that's sort of the basis of our work is always that it is, you know, entrenched in what our elders, our traditionalists, our knowledge keepers teach us about our place on this earth, on this earth and what we use to keep ourselves uh, healthy and strong. So in doing that, you know, as we've been taught uh, by uh, Dr. Laramie, you know, is to acknowledge uh, the natural world, which is our traditions, is what our elders tell us is to be thankful for the water we have, for the food that we have, for the plants that we have, for medicine, you know, for the animals that give us, you know, uh, their meat and their hides for clothing and for our dwellings. And so we honor those four winds, the east wind, the south wind, the west wind, and the north wind. And we honor the earth below that gives us life and the sky above that gives us direction. And that's what we're told to do as humans is to recognize we're not alone in the universe. We're not alone on this earth, that we have to acknowledge we are part of the whole. And it is our job to recognize that. Even though we are now going through this pandemic of COVID, I see you know, the indigenous community stepping up and, you know, uh, online, you know, uh, they're singing their songs, their traditional songs to each other. They're dancing in their traditional regalia. And they're sharing their medicine, uh, the knowledge about the plant medicines with each other. And so, you know, uh, today as we move forward uh, in the, you know, discussions we're having, you know, the next few days is to always remember to be thankful. And uh, even today, even if you're isolated, uh, you know, uh, put some tobacco on the ground or in some water uh, on the river or the lake uh, to uh, acknowledge those spirits that give us life, those four winds that give us life. And, uh, you know, uh, to get us through these pandemics, not just HIV, but also this COVID-19 pandemic, uh, there's a lot of uncertainties. But again, it's through this relationship with the natural world that we will uh, gain strength and insight uh, in moving forward. So I'd just like to, uh, to end with that. And thank you, Sarah, and the team that's uh, put this on together uh, today. Thank you, Alan. Thanks for opening us up in a good way. Um, hi, hi. We, uh, I so appreciate um, any time that I get to listen to you talk and share stories and share history. Um, so, yeah, I just want to thank you on behalf of everyone um, for for sharing with us today um, uh, about the history of the movement, um, as well as the history of Can and. Um, and about our leaders as well. Um, so next, I'm going to be talking a little bit um, about, I just wanna, sorry, I just wanna also remind people that if you are having any technical difficulties throughout this session, um, that you can click at the top of the screen, there should be a live support button um, that you can click if you, if you need help. Um, and I see that there's quite a few participants now that have joined us. So welcome um, to anyone uh, that wasn't here before when I was uh, when I was welcoming people. Um, and and thank you for being here today. Uh, so my name is Sarah Martin Swapisu. Um, I am of mixed ancestry, Inu, also known as Cree, um, and Ukrainian. I live in uh, Winnipeg, uh, Manitoba. Um, Anishinaabe land, the heartland of the Métis Nation, uh, and um, uh, I am, am grateful uh, to you all for being here today. I'm going to share a little bit about um, the Promising Practices program uh, at the Canadian Aboriginal AIDS Network. 
Um, and one of the projects that we've been working on, um, which is the Wise Practice Info Sheets project. Um, uh, so uh, just to share a little bit about the Promising Practices program, uh, the Promising Practices project uh, provides a series of educational tools and resources, uh, as well as activities and events that support Indigenous communities, service providers, and stakeholders, and respects the dignity, self-determination, and strength of Indigenous people. The intention of the project is to provide tools and resources to Indigenous people and organizations so that they may develop approaches that are of their benefit to improving community health and wellness outcomes. So, one of the projects uh, as Promising Practices Coordinator, um, I joined uh, the Canadian Aboriginal AIDS Network in June. Um, so I am, I am new uh, to the organization, relatively new to the organization. Um, and uh, one of the first projects that I started working on was the Wise Practices Info Sheets project. Um, and so uh, CAN developed four information sheets um, these info sheets are short evidence-based resources uh, and they're intended to provide service providers with wise, practice, wise practices and wise practice recommendations that when implemented would strengthen Indigenous-based services and programming. Uh, this project was an example of cro cross collaboration between CAN's research and programs teams with the purpose of putting research and project outcomes into wise practices within our communities. So, oh, next slide. Thank you. Uh, so the four information sheets that CAN developed um, are called uh, Indigenous Leadership in HIV AIDS, Creating Safer Spaces for Indigenous Women Living with HIV AIDS, Being an Indigenous Youth is Not a Risk Factor, and Documenting Lessons Learned, um, Responding to HIV, Tuberculosis, and Hepatitis C in Indigenous Communities Globally. Next slide. So I want to share a little bit about the timeline of this project. Uh, so as I said before, the info sheets were developed last year. Um, and the, um, the info sheets were developed by um, program staff. Um, and they were based on projects and research um, that Ken had done um, in collaboration with other organizations and also internally, um, as well as uh, wise practice documents. Um, so in August, I uh, facilitated a workshop on the four inf information sheets with the wise practice recommendations to three organizations. The organizations that participated in the workshop uh, were Prince Albert Métis Women's Association, Healing Our Nations, and Youth Co. Participating organizations um, uh, were offered resources and support to implement the ideas they came up with in the workshop. So um, in the workshop, uh, we uh, did a couple of activities, did an overview uh, and talked about the wise pra practice recommendations uh, on the info sheets uh, and gave examples of them. Um, and then we broke the organizations up into breakout groups uh, and the organizations did uh, an activity around assessing where they were at, uh, you know, what are some uh, ways that they already reflect those wise practices um, or promising practices uh, that are on the info sheets, because we know that, um, you know, in many Indigenous communities and organizations um, uh, al already reflect these wise practices that we're, that we're talking about, the wise practices that are on the info sheets. Um, and a lot of the knowledge uh, that are on the info sheets come from um, those Indigenous communities and organizations. Um, and so uh, we um, gave organizations an opportunity to reflect, to, to uh, think about like, how do we already reflect these and what are we already doing um, in terms of these wise practices in our programming and our work. Uh, and then we switched gears and got them to think about like what are ways that we can implement these further in our work and in our programming. Um, so then after the workshop, um, as I said before, they were offered resources and support to implement the ideas uh, they came up with in the workshop. Um, and then 
Um, August to October, um, they uh, implemented with implementation time, so implemented ideas or talked about the wise practices when they're within their own organizations or communities further um, and came up with plans to implement them. Um, and then we also did, we, I sent the organizations who participated questionnaires or evaluations um, partway through the project in September, uh, as well as at the end of October. Um, at the end of October, um, uh, I sent them a final questionnaire um, to assess, uh, just to get information about how useful or helpful the info sheets were um, and the workshop, uh, as well as the support that was given. Um, and then I also met um, with a couple of the organizations as well um, to chat about that process. Um, in November, we compiled the final findings report about the project, and then in December, um, we're here <laughs> and we're talking about it. So um, that's that has been the project timeline so far. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, each info sheet next um, and just do a, a quick overview um, of the wise practice recommendations that are within each information sheet. Um, the info sheets were also provided uh, to you on the platform um, so you can um, download them and use them um, within your own work um, or just to, to look over uh, a little bit later. So um, I'll just do an overview of the wise practice recommendations on the info sheets, and then I'll talk about the final findings from the project, from the implementation project, um, when working with the, the organizations this year. The first info sheet I'll talk about is um, called Documenting Lessons Learned. Um, next slide. Uh, so a little bit of background uh, about this info sheet. Um, this info sheet and the wise practice recommendations within it uh, were based on a report called Documenting Lessons Learned and Measuring Progress Towards Global HIV, TB, and Hepatitis C Targets in Indigenous Communities Project. Um, and uh, some, some background about the report. Um, so the Office of International Affairs for the Health Portfolio Portfolio at the Public Health Agency of Canada invited CAN and uh, IGWA, um, the International Indigenous Working Group on HIV AIDS, to submit a funding request under the International Health Grants Program. The documenting lessons learned and measuring progress towards global HIV, TB, and hepatitis C targets in Indigenous Communities Project was initiated in response. Fortunate rates of HIV, TB, uh, viral hepatitis and STBBIs uh, within Indigenous communities. Um, so the report that, that the wise practice recommendations within this info sheet are based on um, blends and amplifies the experiences and viewpoints of Indigenous persons, policymakers, program developers, and researchers from across the globe through the sharing of lessons learned and of wise and promising models of care for translating these lessons into effective policies and programs. Um, this includes concrete recommendations for advancing work towards global targets on HIV, TB, and hepatitis C. Um, next slide. Um, so I just wanted to share one of the quotes that I pulled out from, from the larger report. Um, and if people want to access the larger report, it is referenced on the Documenting Lessons Learned info sheet. Um, uh, so you can access it there. Um, so one of the quotes from one of the participants um, who participated in the gathering um, that led to uh, the information shared in the report um, was because of the disproportionate burden of HIV and other chronic um, and infectious diseases, we often only hear about the challenges and deficits in health, meaning we do not hear about the best practices happening at the community level. Solutions to the epidemic need to be community led and community driven, where people with lived experience are leading the response. Many Indigenous communities across the globe have identified successful community-led and driven interventions that can be shared and, and adapted to other Indigenous communities. Um, so I think that's one important wise practice um, that we will uh, also mention, um, that I will also mention a couple times when I do this overview. Um, but we know that uh, the expertise um, and information about how to address um, you know, uh, uh, issues happening in our communities um, often live within our knowledge and within our communities. Um, 
Next slide. Another quote that I pulled out um, was, HIV has a spirit and is spiritual in and of itself. With an Indigenous worldview, it is a living being and should be respected as such. HIV is an outcome of colonization. The approach within a Western worldview is to imprison and isolate HIV instead of looking at how we can better manage it holistically. Um, and I pulled out this quote as another example of a wise practice within the report um, because um, you know, in listening to many knowledge keepers um, speak about um, STBBIs um, and HIV, I often hear this teaching that HIV has a spirit um, and is spiritual in and of itself. Um, and, and the understanding of um, Indigenous worldview and Indigenous understandings of STBBIs and HIV um, uh, is, is also an important thing to, to talk about um, and balance with the Western worldview um, and Western uh, information that we share about STBBIs and HIV in our work and programming. Um, next slide. So some wise practices um, that uh, are identified on the, on the info sheet, the Documenting Lessons Learned info sheet, um, are number one, to promote self-management processes that build self-determination. Um, so this means having a person-centered approach in which individuals are centered and encouraged to choose treatment and care options that best suit their needs and preferences. Number two, to seek new and innovative ways of promoting good health by disrupting the status quo. So we need a paradigm shift where a human rights and intersectional approach is taken to break down barriers to, to access to ensure equitable health outcomes. Number three, operate from a decolonized lens. An indigenous worldview is paramount, um, which is sort of what I was just talking about. Um, so we need to provide information so that indigenous peoples can manage their health in a holistically sound manner. Number four, build national and international alliances that contribute to the good health of indigenous peoples. Uh, so we need to align national and international infection related strategic documents closely with the principles of indigenous knowledge and documentation, such as this report. Number five, um, sharing an ancestral knowledge in a way that benefits Indigenous peoples. Um, so we know that traditional knowledge must be respected as e equally valuable as Western knowledge. Next, to provide resources to Indigenous communities so that they can develop and, and implement processes that address their health priorities. Um, successful programs require long-term funding, not only a pilot project basis. The last one is, we need to identify wise practices that contribute to the good health of Indigenous peoples and communities. Um, so we know that data is vital in determining community action um, and significant efforts and resources need to be devoted to capacity building and data collection, especially at the community level. Next slide. Uh, the second info sheet that can develop um, is called Indigenous Leadership in HIV AIDS. Um, and uh, this info sheet was developed by um, the, the GPA coordinator um, with CAN. And um, the wise practice recommendations are, are largely pulled from um, the Greater Involvement of People Living with HIV, the GPA Good Practice Guide, um, and a document called Empowerment of People Living with HIV in Their Network. So next slide. Um, so we know that Indigenous people know what works best for their own nations and communities. Um, and, uh, you know, one quote that I also pulled out of the Documenting Lessons Learned report that I thought was quite powerful is, says, Indigenous peoples have a wealth of experience and skills developed and refined over thousands of years in overcoming challenges to their health and well-being. As people who have lived and flourished in the face of adversity, Indigenous peoples have accumulated and refined practices that provide protection against a multitude of illnesses and infections. Indigenous peoples have had to draw on this experience, wisdom, and knowledge to confront modern day challenges to their health, especially in relation to the infections, HIV, TB, viral hepatitis, and STIs. Um, and so I think this quote does, uh, I, I wanted to share this quote because it encompasses um, the idea um, of Indigenous people um, 
and specifically indigenous people living with HIV and AIDS um, as leaders um, in, in this work. Next slide. So we know that uh, Indigenous-led development of wise prevention practices is realized through the implementation of um, the meaningful engagement um, of people living with HIV and AIDS. The meaningful uh, involvement or engagement of people living with HIV, um, we know that uh, Indigenous people living with HIV and AIDS, um, IPHA-led development of initiatives is essential to adequately addressing um, HIV transmission in Indigenous communities. An IPHA-led development approach sensitizes and validates research, treatment models, and service delivery, delivery that addresses the ongoing impacts of colonization, discrimination, poverty, and stigma. Uh, an IPHA-led development approach delivers peer-led education that brings credibility and value to the community. It empowers those most impacted by creating opportunities for people to be part of their own solutions in their own communities and removes the paternalism in service delivery systems. It also informs and improves the efficacy of safer sex practices, harm reduction, and destigmatization of HIV initiatives. Next slide. Um, so ex some examples um, that are on the WISE uh, practice info sheet are um, some examples of IPHA leadership are um, Participation in the development and monitoring of HIV-related policies and impact social policy reform. Um, contribution to strategic planning and program development from, in from initial project, conception, design, and implementation to the monitoring and evaluation of activities. Another example of IPHA leadership um, is leadership through membership on board of directors, executive committees, and their governing bodies employment in organizations that directly serve Indigenous people living with HIV and AIDS. Um, another example of leadership is developing capacity through the de delivery of training and peer education and by filling consultative and advisory roles. And, uh, as well as the la lastly, advocacy through speaking campaigns and public events to increase the accessibility of services and mobilize resources, particularly in law reform. Next slide. Lastly, the WISE practice activities um, that are on the WISE practice info sheet um, uh, are, um, that are highlighted are uh, having an organizational commitment, um, doing organizational assessment um, in terms of how your organization is doing uh, when it comes to um, the greater involvement of people um, living with HIV or the meaningful engagement um, of people living with HIV and AIDS. Um, within your organization, um, barriers to participation are identified and addressed. Um, there is recognition in, of competencies as well as credentials. Um, your organization creates capacity building activities um, for all staff um, and especially for um, IPHAs within your organization. Um, training and skills development opportunities. Um, supportive I HIV work pol workplace policies uh, are important. Um, always having remuneration for people living with HIV, um, as well as creating supportive organizations um, and, and supporting organizations of people living with HIV. Uh, having psychosocial supports um, and peer support uh, integrated within your organizations and programming. Uh, having dedicated resources um, to implementing um, MEPA within your organization. Uh, and lastly, um, ensuring a rights-based approach um, and non-judgmental approaches to this work. Next slide. The third uh, info sheet that Ken developed uh, is called Creating Safer Spaces for Indigenous Women Living with HIV. Next slide. Um, so the Creating Safer Spaces for Indigenous Women Living with HIV info sheet was created by the Indigenous Women's uh, uh, Leadership Coordinator at CAN um, and the AHA Center Community-Based Research Manager. 
Uh, WISE practices were compiled from various research and projects, including Environments of Nurturing Safety, or EONS, Our Search for Safer Spaces, um, and the Visioning Health 1 and 2 project. WISE prevention, WISE prevention practices, uh, so some of the WISE prevention practices um, that were identified, um, three main practices were um, that prevention education is knowledge. Uh, number two, that culture saves lives. Number three, um, we need to make our organizations or communities um, safer spaces. So uh, the first one, prevention education, oh, next slide. The first one, prevention education is knowledge, um, uh, acknowledges that HIV is a teacher. It helps us to talk about difficult topics like sexuality, sexual orientation, disclosure, and more importantly, helps to address misconceptions and myths. By having open and non-judgmental conversations about HIV and other STBBIs with community, friends, and family, we give them the tools to make informed, healthy decisions. Next slide. The second one, Culture Saves Lives, acknowledges that Indigenous tradition and culture are healing and a way to celebrate Indigenous roots. Learning about Indigenous culture and partnering with local Indigenous organizations organizations, care providers, or knowledge keepers to provide culturally relevant care can help mainstream organizations create a safer space for their Indigenous service users or clients. Next slide. The third one, making your organization or community a safer space, um, acknowledges that Indigenous HIV and AIDS service organizations should work to ensure they provide a safer space for Indigenous women living with HIV and AIDS. Organizations can consider assessing how well they are meeting gender-specific needs, identify the gender-based barriers preventing access to services, and devote the necessary human and financial resources to filling gender gaps in service provision. I also wanted to mention that when we talk about meeting gender-specific needs, it is equally important to think about how to create anti-oppressive and safer spaces for uh, the 2S, for 2ST LGBTQ plus relatives. Um, in our organizations, programming, and communities. Um, we acknowledge that colonial harm, acknowledging the harms of homophobia and transphobia. We know that many indigenous nations pre-colonization celebrated and honored sexual and gender diversity. Next slide. Um, so some creating safer spaces activities that were identified um, on the information sheet. Um, were to provide basic culturally relevant education about HIV, HCV, and STBBIs um, within, uh, within our programming. Uh, the second one was to invite um, an Indigenous woman living with HIV or AIDS um, or women living with HCV um, or other STBBIs to share their story and answer questions. Next one was to create a safer spaces or anti-oppression policy statement and post it in public places to show commitment to creating a safer space. Um, and I'd also add that um, we know that uh, with safer spaces policies, um, that uh, it's not enough to just create them and put them on the wall within our organizations or programs. Um, we also need to create policies and procedures for putting them into action. Um, and create integrated care programs um, that holistically care for the whole person in culturally relevant ways. Um, all of those things contribute to creating a safer space. Next one is increasing partnerships with regional um, uh, Indigenous women living with HIV or AIDS organizations and invite them to facilitate capacity building events. Review policies and procedures to ensure excellence in confidentiality practices. And lastly, Post information sessions with women to identify what training they want. Um, so we know that uh, you know community-based programming um, is best when it's informed by the communities that we are trying um, or endeavoring to serve. Um, and as we hear over and over uh, again in this work, um, this the um, how important it is uh, that our programming is, is always informed and led. Uh, by Indigenous people living with HIV uh, and AIDS. Nothing um, about us without us. Um, yes. Next slide. So the next info sheet that was created is called Being an Indigenous Youth is Not a Risk Factor. Um, so this info sheet 
uh, it pulls from a research project or doc document called Beyond at Risk. Um, this was a project of the National Indigenous Youth Council on Sexual Health and HIV um, and AIDS, Nishka, and the Canadian Aboriginal AIDS Network in collaboration with professors uh, Natalie Clark of Thompson Rivers University and Sarah Hunt uh, of the University of British Columbia. Um, and in this, uh, the info sheet, the wise practice recommendations within the info sheet um, is based off of this project. Um, where Indigenous youth from across Canada on the Youth Council were interested in consulting with other Indigenous youth about the term at risk um, and being labeled at risk and what uh, being labeled at risk youth um, and what other language might be used to talk about their lives and identities. Um, so a total of 25 youth from across Canada completed surveys um, and answered questions. Um, and then the team of youth co-researchers um, with CANS Research uh, program and the youth leadership coordinator at the time then used arts based methods to identify key findings uh, and wise practices. Next slide. Um, so, some of the wise practices that were uh, identified um, and some of the feedback that came from that project from Indigenous youth. Um, and what they'd like to say to us about that term um, uh, and the language of being called at risk um, is that Indigenous youth reject the idea that they are inherently at risk because they are Indigenous. Indigenous youth have defined colonialism and vulnerabilities associated with the social determinants of health as a source of their risk for exposure to HIV AIDS. Um, Strength-based approaches are preferred among Indigenous youth. Um, and I think this, um, you know, um, speaks to the narratives that we use when we talk about our communities and our relatives. Um, and, uh, you know, poses uh, the question to us, how are we speaking about our relatives um, and about, about youth, about young people? Um, we must think about the narratives and the stories that we're telling when we talk about stats, when we make fact sheets about our communities and our relatives. Um, I just want to share that, uh, one time I was at a heart medicine gathering in Winnipeg, um, which uh, is organized by Gani Ganichuk, an, uh, an indigenous led uh, organization in Winnipeg. Um, and um, someone named Tasha Spillett was speaking at this heart medicine gathering. Um, and she shared this quote um, about, uh, about deficit based stats. Um, those numbers are, are heart wrenching to, the, to those of us who are heart tied to them. Those numbers are, are heart-wrenching to those of us who are heart-tied to them. Um, and I think this really speaks to um, some of the deficit-based narratives that we hear sometimes. Um, are we telling only deficit-based stats and facts that encompass narratives that in effect perpetuates the harms of colonialism? Um, or are we telling stories of resilience, strength, community care, and cultural knowledge? Um, are we balancing the narratives? Um, are we are we sharing? So some of the um, so uh, the indigenous youth um, that participated in this project um, identified four uh, four um, messages that they would like adults to contemplate. Number one, uh, beyond simplistic stereotypes lie the strengths and complex knowledge of indigenous youth. Number two. Singular narratives about Native youth are harmful, recognizing that youth are situated in networks of relationships which can provide strength, skills, knowledge, and sustenance is empowering. Number three, youth have expert knowledge of their own lives and their voices deserve to be heard. And number four, they have said that negativity is heavy on our souls. Next slide. Youth have said they don't access services because they don't like how they are treated by professionals. They feel stigmatized by professionals when they hear judgmental comments on their need to access a service, on their sexuality, their choices, their substance use, their age, or their race. One quote uh, was using hurtful language as heavy on our souls, especially when it's spoken in one's own community. Youth are more likely to access services and support when such places are are safer spaces uh, and stigma-free spaces. Youth want compassionate, strength-based support for testing, treatment, and related services. 
Uh, next slide. So some wise practice um, activities um, that were identified uh, in this info sheet uh, from that project um, are respect. Um, so respect by using harm reduction and trauma-informed approaches to treating the whole person. Number two, inclusivity. Um, we need to welcome 2ST LGBTQ plus folks by supporting all gender identities, sexual orientations, and relationships in our programming and organizations. Number three, acceptance of lifestyle and substance use. Uh, we need to meet youth where they are at. Number four, cultural and community support. Um, so we need to have access to, to traditional practices. Support of elders and ceremony has a preventative effect. Number five, localized. Uh, we need to provide access to cultural activities, language lessons, elders, and traditions to help youth to know their culture and to draw strength from their community. Next one is uh, holistic. Um, we need to use approaches that address the whole person without stigma. Next one is strength-based. Um, so we need to use a positive perspective and positive language that affirms positive qualities modeled by youth. Last one is arts-based. So using arts-based research and programs to talk about difficult subjects is a recognized good practice for engaging youth in a meaningful way. Um, so one of the wise practices uh, that the youth identified was strength-based. Um, and uh, sometimes we also talk about like trauma-informed and strength-based approaches. Um, and uh, I think this really speaks to um, some of the teachings around um, blood bone memory and connection to this work. Um, so blood bone memory um, is a teaching um, that has been shared with me and probably many others. Um, and, uh, you know, Western science might call it epigenetics. Um, so we know that uh, that it talks about how the pain and the trauma of our ancestors is is, um, it, is still uh, living within us. Um, however, uh, a strength-based approach um, and, and part of that teaching um, that has been identified as well is that we also carry uh, the gifts, the strength, um, the resilience, and the spirit of our ancestors. Um, and not just the pain, and that we we use those gifts and that strength and that that resilience and that knowledge from our ancestors um, to address um, the pain um, and trauma that we carry. Um, so uh, if we're so that is a, a good teaching in terms of wise practices as well. Um, the youth are telling us to have a strength-based perspective in our work, um, as well as a def uh, and and to challenge those damage-based or deficit-based perspectives, um, uh, and and to challenge the language uh, of of at-risk youth. So, if we are talking about the pain uh, and sharing stats, um, sharing. Um, stats that talk about the disproportionate amounts of um, our relatives that are um, affected by HIV. Um, perhaps we uh, can also highlight the existing wellness and culture-based community initiatives uh, that are addressing them. Um, and I know that many of our organizations and programs uh, already do this and use our gifts and strengths and knowledge um, to, address, um, to address the challenges and issues in our communities. Um, uh, another one that was identified was, was um, the arts-based uh, engagement approach. Um, and so we know that many programs and organizations, um, you know, while doing workshops uh, or simultaneous with, uh, you know, providing workshops in communities, um, do, uh, you know, run beading or crafts uh, or just put out papers and pencils or markers or coloring sheets um, for youth to draw with um, or doodle with or color with um, or to craft. Um, and, uh, you know, the, that arts-based engagement, I know that um, Albert talked about that wise practice when um, he was doing the opening. Um, uh, we know that our artists um, carry those gifts that, that really, uh, that do um, hold up our communities um, and, and strengthen our communities. Um, and so, 
um, by engaging uh, youth in art or, um, or beading um, or other crafts, uh, we can also bring in some of our culture into the workshops that we provide in communities. Uh, one organization that I used to work with would also uh, uh, print out um, uh, uh, 2ST LGBTQ plus affirming coloring sheets um, and have them uh, during workshops so that youth uh, you know, could color during the workshops, but also uh, be given these, um, these uh, affirming um, uh, uh, messages while they were, doing, while they were uh, listening to the information. Next slide. So now that I've um, sort of talked and highlighted about uh, the wise practice recommendations in the info sheets um, and, uh, uh, and, and talked a lot, um, uh, I'm just going to quickly uh, go over some of the final findings um, from the info sheets project uh, with working with the organizations. Um, so as I said before, there were there were three organizations that participated in the workshop in August, um, where we uh, looked at the wise practice recommendations from the info sheets, um, and then from August to uh, October, we uh, the organizations um, uh, implemented some of the uh, some of the wise practice recommendations. Um, or talked in their organizations uh, about how they could be helpful or made plans for the future. So some of the final findings, um, uh, without, uh, first of all, all workshops, uh, all workshop participants strongly agreed that the info sheets were relevant to their work. Um, so that's good. <laughs> Next slide. Uh, all participants either agreed or strongly agreed that they plan to use at least one of the info sheets in their work. Um, and participants either agreed or strongly agreed that their organization is ready to apply at least one of the practices described on the info sheet. Again, the organizations that participated were Prince Albert Métis Women's Association, um, Healing Our Nations, uh, and um, Youth Co. When asked what they like best about the workshop um, and info sheets, participants shared the following. How much holistic learning and healing is in the promising practices? Uh, I liked um, that the info sheets were presented in a very practical way. I enjoyed being able to actually have some time to think about a way in which we could incorporate the, these ideas into current work right now. Um, I thought that was helpful in being able to think about how these um, how these practices um, uh, will be helpful in the future um, with the other prop promising practices ideas as well. Um, the presentation was very well done. A lot of great, a lot of great information was shared by a lot of great people. Um, I liked getting a thorough read through the info sheets. That was helpful, as well as the given time to discuss how our organization could implement some of the best practices and the supports that we need to do that. Um, and lastly, they thought it was interesting um, to hear the perspective of other educators across the country. Um, so um, another. Another um, outcome and purpose of the of the workshop uh, was relationship building and getting organizations to um, listen and, and learn from each other. Um, uh, in all of the work that I do, I um, try and I I like to I don't position myself as an expert um, in this work. I have um, I have twelve years of experience um, uh, doing this this work um, and being a, a, a health educator. Um, and I also know that, um, as we talked about before in the wise practice recommendations, um, that each community and organization um, carries their own, own wise practices uh, and information and expertise in this work. Um, so I try to provide opportunities for organizations to, uh, to share their own uh, expertise and, and learnings um, in the work that they do. Next slide. Um, when asked what they like best about the workshop, oh, sorry, I don't know what happened there. Oh, sorry, next slide. <laughs> There's one behind there, sorry about that. Uh, I also wanted to say that um, there was a suggestion from a participant in the workshop um, from the organizations uh, for CAN to host this workshop 
or a workshop like this for policymakers and funders so that they may better understand wise practices and values in our field of work. Um, next, uh, in regards to how participants' views changed in the final project questionnaire, 100% of participants agreed that the InfoSheets project changed the way they thought about the communities that they work with. In terms of behavior change, 75% of participants agreed and 25% stated that they um, were neutral or undecided when asked if the info sheets changed the way that they worked with communities. Next slide. In both questionnaires, 100% of participants said that they shared or discussed the wise practices with a colleague. 100% um, of participants in September and 50% in October said that they integrated the promising practices or the wise practices into their current work. Two participants added the following comments. We have reviewed them in our team meetings and we are making plans to further integrate the wise practices into our work. And much of the way we think about our communities is the same as what has been presented. This confirmed many of our ideas and practices and also has incentivized us to spend more intentional time thinking about how to incorporate more of these wise practices. Next slide. When asked to share specific examples of how the wise practices described in the info sheets has been or could be used in their programs or communities, participants shared um, in September, uh, they shared that um, there's been an increase in awareness activities. Uh, they have increased awareness activities with direct involvement of youth um, and women. Um, they integrated cultural and trauma and trauma um, based approaches, approaches in educational materials. Um, they also said our team is considering how we can integrate more arts-based community programming. We think this could be used in our programs or communities to engage youth in a meaningful way with our content and curriculum. We can use art to bring in culture as well. Uh, in October, um, participants shared um, that they um, are planning um, to do a community needs assessment. Uh, they said that they talked about having more arts-based activities integrated into their programs again. Um, they engaged youth um, and impl implemented culturally relevant topics. Um, we've involved youth more in our programming. We tried more culturally designed narratives in our programs. And we have started to make the workshops more culturally center centered based on the info sheet uh, recommendations. Next slide. 75% uh, of participants in September and 50% of participants in October said that they integrated the wise practices into plans for future work. And all participants either agreed or strongly agreed that the info sheets would be useful in future program planning. Next slide. When asked if they have plans for using the information from this project or the info sheets in their programming or services in the future, participants stated um, yes within, harm, within the harm reduction field, ensuring information is accurate. Um, if we had more support for our higher ups, from our higher ups, yes, we would. I think having arts-based teachings in our programs would make a difference in our delivery, delivery of topics on HIV, hepatitis C, sexual health, and harm reduction. Um, we approach our workshops by being peer led and I think being youth, we can always hear how to do things better, but also share what we do well too. Uh, they said, yes, we are working on barrier reduction strategies to addressing HIV. They also said, um, we continue to center indigenous knowledge and make our work more culturally centered. Uh, and lastly, um, we, incorporate tra we incorporated trauma informed and creating safer space practices in our work. Um, when asked what, oh, next slide. When asked what other info sheets would be helpful to them and their organizations and what they would like to learn more about in the future, participants stated the following, more opportunities to connect with other organizations would be nice, it would be nice to hear what they are doing. Um, uh, giving more examples related to each wise practice on the info sheets would be helpful. Uh, We'd like to see a year-to-year -year comparisons of HIV and other STBBI stats, uh, an up-to-date yearly number of new cases with detailed demographic information. Uh, culturally di cultural diversity training and learning materials centered around youth, uh, LGBTQ+, and people who use substances. Uh, uh, we'd like to see information about core values to approaching this work. 
um, at, for example, 2ST, LGBTQ+, inclusive, trauma-informed, etc. Um, we'd like to see info sheets on uh, uh, wise practice info sheets about strength-based, um, as well as arts-based engagement strategies. So, um, uh, next slide. Um, so uh, that is all I have to share. Um, I know that I've been talking for quite a while uh, and I am getting sick of hearing my own voice as I'm sure you are maybe getting sick of hearing my voice. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, thanks for listening to um, my overview of the wise uh, practice um, recommendations on, our in on the info sheets um, and uh, the final findings of the project. Um, next, I'm going to um, be introducing uh, Brian. Um, give me one second. Um, so Brian Amperville works at Prince Albert Métis Women's Association, Women's Association as a community health prevention specialist. Um, and, um, and Prince Albert Métis Women's Association, as I mentioned before, was one of the organizations that participated um, in the InfoSheets project. And I'm just going to ask Brian a couple of questions, um, and uh, he's going to share with us um, uh, some impacts in, in, in his work and organization from participating, um, or just share how helpful, if, if the InfoSheets were helpful um, uh, in, in, in his work. Hi, Brian. Good morning. Um, so sorry about the mask, but we. Uh, so one of the first questions. Um, oh, yeah, no, we have health inspector come in every other oh, no, day. Yeah, apologize. and they <laughs> make sure that everyone in our office, even if we're in our own office, we still have to wear a mask. So, which is sickening, but you gotta do what you gotta do, I guess. Okay, thanks for saying. Yes, that's great. Thank you for thank you for doing that, and thanks for letting us know. Um, I am uh, working from home, so that's why I'm not wearing a mask. <laughs> um, but thank you for being here and joining us today. Thank you. Um, I know that you have a busy day. Uh, so I uh, just want to ask if you can share a little bit about the work that you do and how the info sheets have been helpful in your work. Okay. Uh, our program has different parts. Our regular group presentations individual mentoring, uh, street outreach activities, community events and awareness campaigns, social media outlets, and capacity building for other human services. So, yeah, I basically do harm reduction. <laughs> that's, that's what I do, so. And sorry, I'm just a little out. I had lack of sleep the last few days. Um, what was the other question? Okay. No problem. What was the other part of the question? Um, yeah, I was just wondering. Oh, how the info sheets. Um, I was just wondering if you can share, um, and it, yeah, just an example of how the info sheets or workshops um, have been helpful or impactful in your work? Yeah. InfoSheets helped us to make our program more inclusive. We engaged the First Nations perspective and examples needing and preparing our resources. We include culturally designed approaches in our services. We engaged youth and peers in our programs and used the input and feedbacks in our betterment of our services. We include women's voice and life stories and our presentations are chaired, sorry, women's circle talks regarding sexual health stigma and barriers, if that makes any sense. I just put jot notes down because I have the question here and I, sorry about that. I'm just, I'm just trying to stay focused. Oh, no, no, that's great. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, awesome. Um, yeah, I'm done. <laughs> um, can you share um, 
Oh, no, thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, does your program or organization intend to use the info sheets information in the future? Um, how or in what way? Yes, we'll be using info sheets as a guideline to make our programs more culturally orientated and inclusive. And we will oh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, we will use CAN workshops and info sheets to design next level programs that are more individualized and client centered. This will help our clients to take more active role in care and services they receive. Each individual has specific needs and history that require service provider to readjust or redesign the treatment plan or services delivery for specific individual needs for the person. If anyone, can you guys actually hear me with my mask on? Yeah, oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's what I do. No, no problem. And awesome. Thank you for sharing. Um, is there anything else you want? Um, me? No, that's all right. Oh, is there anything else you want? Pardon me? Okay. Well, thank you. Oh, I just wanted to ask if there was anything else you wanted to share no. um, about uh, about the workshop or the project or your participation. Uh, actually, the workshop is okay. like the, what we did early in October. I think it was was like what we were talking, what you were talking about earlier. Is, August. Yeah, okay. August. Okay, is well, like it is very helpful and very useful. Uh, not like. Not everything can we can use, but a lot of it we are using. I just don't have like my desk is a mess, so. But yeah, like everything we use so far, majority of it came from your uh, your your info sheets and that, so they are very helpful. And sorry, I'm just a little nervous talking at the moment as well. No, you're doing great. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much um, for joining us today. And, and thank you so much for sharing how um, the resources and materials were useful uh, in your work and your programming and for sharing those examples. Um, and I also want to say thank you for like participating in this project um, and sharing your expertise and your knowledge and the work that you do in your community. Um, so thanks for yeah. joining us. I'll uh, awesome. I'll email you my answers just in case you want Great. them. So, and if anyone's got questions, like I said to Sarah before, that she can just text me, and then I'll answer them as soon as I can. But yeah, I got a uh, funding meeting. Great. I got to head to Great. here in five minutes. So thank you guys for having me, and we'll see you in tomorrow sessions for whatever is on for tomorrow and gail you're making me shy awesome thank you thanks for joining okay. us thank you <laughs> okay we'll see you guys. You're, you're doing great thank you thanks so much for joining yeah. us Have a thank good you meeting. for having me okay bye um thank you great um, awesome. Um, so thank you. Uh, uh, thank you to Brian for joining us and for sharing um, some of the learnings and impacts um, of the uh, InfoSheets project and workshop um, and some of the uh, things that they're doing in their organization and community. So next, um, I'm going to stop talking for a little bit, <laughs> uh, and I'm going to introduce to you um, Vanessa Anakudwabasekwe. Hi, Vanessa. <laughs> um, so Vanessa uh, Anakudwabasekwe is a member of Pegwis First Nation, and she lives in Winnipeg, a city built on Indigenous nations. She is of the Turtle Clan, an Indigenous sexual health facilitator, mother, and Skabekwe, or helper to the people in all the circles of her life. 
Vanessa prides herself on her Indigenous education, graduating from Children of the Earth High School and obtaining a First Nation counseling degree from Brandon University. Her highest education comes from time spent in nature and with the very best teachers, the elders, medicine people, and family who grace her life. Um, Vanessa will be modeling a wise practice approach within, indi within um, Indigenous sexual health education, um, connecting the concept of consent and bodily auton autonomy to land and Indigenous sovereignty um, with uh, her visualization activity titled uh, Land is Body or Earth is Body, maybe it's called now. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you, Vanessa. Oh, chimi gwich, Sarah. Thank you. So yes, as Sarah said, in addition to Anakwad Wabasekwe, most people call me Vanessa because it's easier to say. Mikanak na dotiem, ashkode bijike gichitak. Loud so the spirits can hear me as well. And that actually helps me a lot and helps. Um, so thank you, Sarah, um, for passing me this tobacco that I'm holding on to really today. <laughs> I'll be putting it. But thank you for the opportunity to thank the Aboriginal AIDS uh, network. You're doing. Um, also to all the people that are. I trust that you're there. So much about technology, um, but thank you for the hard work that you're doing in your family and in your communities, um, and even if you're taking care of. That's a lot. So, um, miigwech. And Albert, um, Elder Dr. McLeod, um, thank you for the hard work through the years and for sharing the names of other forever. It's always good to acknowledge them. That. Um, so this tobacco is packed. This and his body visualization. When I wrote it up it was called land is body um and i called it a land acknowledgement because at the time i was that everybody's doing land acknowledgements but missing that heart felt peace so i thought let's do a real that land as connection to our body and as things go and grow um we evolve and now i'm earth is body and body is because land is that sort of term or colonial ideal of like land is property and I where really it's about us belonging to the earth um, but as indigenous people of course like land <laughs> it's still our land land back and all those things that still applies so you'll see that this is uh, can be land or earth interchangeably um, so I guess we'll get into it really what this is going to be is a visualization so um, it's just pretending in your mind, um, and we're just gonna first our bodies um, to the earth or to the land around us. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually turn my camera off so there'll be just black screen. That way nobody has to even look at me. And I encourage folks to just get comfortable if you wanna do this visualization. It's super gentle, it's pretty quick, um, but awareness of our body. So if for any reason you wanna think about my I don't want to bring awareness to it. To do it, and it, it won't be that long, anyways. For this, is a glimpse of um, an Indigenous worldview or an Anishin. We know that there's, of course, a variety in Indigenous nations seeing the world. My teachings come from an Anishinaabe nation. In Anishinaabe world that into. So if everybody can get, hopefully you're in a quiet space, get comfortable, close your eyes if you like to. I'm just gonna start and I'm gonna turn, I'll turn the camera back on when we are done the visualization and can regroup. So I hope you're comfortable. Maybe take a deep breath or earth. It could be a yard, a park, a place you travel to, your home, familiar to you. Just look. Now go inside of your body, bring awareness to your body. Weight is sitting 
and know your body is the same and the same as that earth it's ever connected so we're going to explore this in all things why oceans waterfalls on the earth can you find these in your body floods currents gushings where do they happen in your body you might think of your veins your genitals in your bladder have you taken a pee today you've made your very own water think of your tears are they sad or happy streams just like water on the earth water in our bodies the stones the rocks on the land the grasses and the mosses growing and blowing in the wind and rains where in your body are these Think of your bones, your hard spot, toes, and the places your hair grows. What's in between your toes? And where are your swamplands? Do you have any desert areas? What's in your belly button right now? To the winds. And as it blows the train and the rain across the earth, from small gentle breezes to big gusty winds, where is wind in your body? Take a deep breath in and let it out, slowly making your Take a deep breath in. You can make that wind any speed you want as you let it out. Think of other places your body uses wind. You might think of weather systems. Just like a tornado on the earth, a tornado can happen in our body. Have you ever farted so loud you surprised yourself? <laughs> oh, big one. And laughter. What is laughter but cleansing wind releasing through our body? Sometimes loud as thunderstorms on the earth, we laugh and laugh. There's thunder in our body. Now see the fire on the earth. From a spark to a flame to a big blaze. Locate the fire in your body. Can you feel where your heat is? Where does your heat and warmth come from? Or of the earth, our body warms us. There is fire in the body. Your synapses are firing away right now, telling each cell what to visualize, what to see, what to do. There's lightning in our body. Now think back to the land, the earth. See the mountains, the hills, the plains, caves, and crevices. Where in your body are your hills, your flat places, your caves and crevices? Have you ever felt tectonic plates move? Ever felt your body quake and tremble like the earth? Now going back to that land that you started with, that familiar place you know, it doesn't matter your body as that sacred place, which is the same as that beautiful land, or that land you know, beautiful so you know that you are beautiful and sacred too the land and us we are one and the same what happens to the earth happens to the body now think of your body know it in your stones and your bones it's my body my territory you might even say that my territory if you were to make treaty with someone if you were one into or onto your territory how important would that treaty be remember my body my territory so i'll just give folks like one minute <laughs> to come back from that visualization so i know it um can be a really good grounding exercise. Um, sometimes and they're like, oh, that's nice, and I feel calm. Look a little frozen there. Hello. So um, in that sense, it can be a good experience to get sort of a glimpse of an indigenous worldview and to experience that. And we know that for sure these worldviews are alive and well in lots of places, lots of communities lots of people and actually indigenous nations throughout the world. But it's good to sort of experience it, especially because we're often talking 
indigenous approaches and indigenous ways of being and knowing and doing. And this one can help us like actively connect that and do that. So if we wanted to leave it there, we totally could. We could just leave that as like a lovely way to feel and to be and to connect ourselves. Um, if we wanted to take some of those teachings that are embedded in that visualization further, we could do that too. So um, sure, there's teachings of diversity in there, teachings of inclusiveness, of the beauty of having different lands that are colors and shapes and different functions of the earth. And when we can honor those, we can honor that in our bodies as well, right? So there's tons of teachings on diversity. Um, of course, there's the teachings of consent, right? So talking about our body as our territory and knowing that when we're talking about sexual health, consent teachings are just prominent and so necessary. We're trying to really relearn those or establish those in our society, right? Um, and just like our tobacco teachings, our original teaching, sometimes it's called like the first medicine, um, an Anishinaabe worldview for sure is um, a culture of consent and consent, not just with physical boundaries, which are important, but consent in all things that spiritual, emotional um, consent that's in everything, right? Not even just consent with human beings, but with the earth and the animals and the medicines and the plants. So respect for all life is that consent teaching. So there's lots in there too. Uh, and if we wanted to think about like the treaty process, <laughs> that could be a whole other pathway in there of opening up a conversation with that little visualization. Um, and another one, my favorite one to talk about ever is the sexual health part, right? So some folks, a little bit of that sexuality flowing through them if they had done that visualization felt some of those things and we know that that sexuality is inherent it's part of life and part of the earth and it just like it's on the earth it's unique to each of us too so our sexuality is super unique to every single one of us and it's gonna be expressed or represented um, differently in every person and teachings to that so I love doing this visualization. I love sharing and um, facilitating actually when I can hear feedback and hear what stood out for people and what resonated the most with folks. Um, but it really is such a good teacher and such just like a glimpse into the way our ancestors saw the world. So I think it's really important that we um, try to engage and seek out those indigenous worldviews as much as we can they have a cure for so many of the issues that are ailing us right and when we think about like de it's really about that de-shaming piece too right so we use this word destigmatize, and in a lot of places the word stigma is still like a fancy word right it's a hard concept um so i like to use the term de-shaming and like the earth is never ashamed of its father, right so if we can manage then we can manage to connect that to ourselves and know that no matter what has happened to us, no matter what we live through or go through, we're deserving of a healthy sexuality. We're deserving of understanding of connection of our bodies to that earth. And even knowing that that earth and the wind and the air and the waters and all those can be healed through anything in our life. So there's a lot of different um, ways that this visualization can be used as a tool to help start conversation and discussion and help people actively seek sort of those de-shaming processes. We want to destigmatize, and we have to sort of locate our own shame and make aware of other people's shame. If we know this person's carrying lots of shame with them, we can be more compassionate to them, right? And for sure to not shame else. So there's this wonderful grandmother in my life. I love her so much, and she always says to me, no shaming, we're not shaming anybody. Our people have had enough shame, and that's it. So we try to center this worldviews because they really are all of those for today, right? Those sort of um, big fancy terms um, of approaches of being, um, let me capture what I heard and wrote them all down real fast. But strength space for sure. Um, indigenous ways of being inclusive, of being anti-oppressive. Um, and indigenous ways of being and knowing and living in the world 
understanding of what harm reduction actually is in practice, about dignity for all, about that true consent in all things, uh, the amazing healing power of sovereignty, right? Sovereignty for people. Well, for every person, sovereignty for me, sovereignty for you, and the power of how when we get to be in charge of our own lives, um, and even the earth having its own sovereignty, that's where that comes from. So to me, that's what it's about is that destigmatizing and reclaiming those powers. And for people that have trauma-informed practice, <laughs> it's a good practice, I also encourage people to check out um, healing-centered approaches. So Dr. Sean Ginwright is a black doctor, I believe, from the States who talks about healing-centered approaches. So that's sort of like an extension of trauma-informed. It's like evolving and becoming better. But all of these approaches um, are found in Indigenous worldviews. Like mindfulness right now is all the rage. Oh, we're, we're meditating. But like um, the mindfulness of these lands is what we're healing through. Right. So that's our smudging. That's our that's our pipes. That's our ceremonies. That's the lodges that we're doing. And even this visualization could be mindfulness practice. So we know that when we center our worldviews and we actively seek out to de to try to see through those indigenous eyes, um, there can be a lot of healing found. So I'm going to leave it at that and say Chimikwich for having me here today. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> I hope that's useful in some way. Um, and I believe Can is working on a toolkit that will have that visualization. But yes, we did. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, well, hopefully she will jump back on um, soon. Um, but uh, on behalf of myself and um, Ken, and I think everyone here, I just want to say, Kina um, Naskumpin, hi, hi, um, to Vanessa for those, um, those teachings. Um, and that beautiful uh, visualization tool and activity. Um, and for the wise practice, wise practices that she uh, that she that she shared. Um, oh, hi, Vanessa. Welcome back. I don't know if you heard what I just said. <laughs> um, yeah, it so thing, uh, right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're doing great. I think we so you know good. what? We are all doing so great <laughs> um, in adapting our whole lives to, you know, <laughs> um, to being online uh, and doing everything, everything yes. virtually. Yes. Um, so uh, I'll just say it again. Hi, hi, Kina Naskomadin. Thank you for um, for sharing uh, your uh, your wise practices, your wisdom, uh, and your teachings um, and your knowledge with us um for sharing your stories and that beautiful uh, visualization activity um yeah i think that uh i i have been working with vanessa since uh, i was 21 <laughs> uh, and i'm 34 and um i continue to uh, learn lots from her like every day <laughs> um so i'm so grateful and thankful that she um was able to join us today um uh, and share um, so thank you. <clears throat> um, so now uh, we are going to um, uh, put up that uh, evaluation poll um, with a couple of questions for all of you to answer. Um, and so if you could please fill out that evaluation, um, we would we would greatly appreciate it. Um, and uh, and then we're going to open it up to um, to questions from you. Uh, and uh, feel free to, to ask questions um, to myself um, uh, as well as the other other presenters as well, um, Albert, Vanessa. Um, uh, so we'll um, have a couple minutes for for Q and A. Uh, 
Uh, or if anybody wants to uh, share anything else. Um, yeah, so Vanessa mentioned um, the toolkit. Um, so that is, there, uh, we have a toolkit um, uh, called the Promising Practices Toolkit. Also the Community Readiness Toolkit um, is the same toolkit, um, is on our website uh, right now. However, our website is under construction. Um, you may have noticed if you go to our website, uh, there's a big sign that it says under construction. Um, and we are excited to be developing a new website um, so that's exciting. And also, um, we are, uh, we have a, a, our toolkits um, will be revised and revamped um, uh, and hopefully uh, launched within, within the next year as well. Um, um, so yeah, the community readiness toolkits will have uh, resources um, and tools and activities um, for communities and organizations uh, to use within their programming. Um, so one example would be the info sheets that we talked about today uh, will be in those toolkits, um, as well as activities to go along with them for your organizations. Um, and uh, our community uh, readiness coordinator, Dylan uh, Richardson, um, is uh, providing uh, the community readiness training, keeping our fires uh, training um, uh, all week this week um, from today until Saturday. Um, and uh, the community readiness toolkits, um, you know, one of the one of the goals is to uh, provide communities and organizations who uh, who who go through that community readiness training with tools and resources um, to use after. Uh, they complete the training um, and, uh, you know, identify what stage of readiness they're at um, to supplement their, their work plan and moving forward um, in addressing uh, HIV or STBBIs um, or harm reduction um, within their communities. Hey, Sarah. Yeah. Um, so we had a, dis a discussion question come in um, earlier in the session, but we just thought we'd wait until now. Um, mm -hmm. And it was just about um, the role of two spirit voices um, in some of this work and maybe their inclusion in the future. Um, if you maybe could speak to, to something about that. Um. Sure, yeah. Um, so, oh, sorry, that was Zoe, um, our youth leadership coordinator with the Canadian Aboriginal AIDS Network. Um, yeah, so we know that, uh, you know, in, in the info sheets, um, we did talk about one of the wise practice recommendations being um, 2ST LGBTQ plus um, uh, uh, inclusive um, uh, programming. Um, And um, yeah, and also uh, talking about the uh, importance of when we're talking about creating safer spaces, uh, of creating safer and anti-oppressive spaces within our programming and organizations um, for 2ST LGBTQ plus um, folks. Um, uh, we know that uh, there are uh, absolutely 2ST LGBTQ plus uh, folks who um, work at CAN and also who make up our members um, and our community. Um, that give feedback on um, the programming in our organizations uh, or who participate in our um, research, um, uh, community-based research projects as well. Um, and um, so, yeah, they're, they're um, um, uh, yeah, I, I guess that's what I would say in terms of like 2SD LGBTQ plus inclusion. Um, there was one some feedback uh, in the info sheets final findings um, that talked about um, um, one of the organizations identifying that they'd like uh, they'd like more information and uh, wise practice um, activities or recommendations around um, uh, like uh, including 2SD LGBTQ plus um, uh, programming um, or activities or making their organization or programming a safer space. Um, 
so uh, that was some feedback that was given and um, I know that I said when I talked about the info sheets overview um, that uh, community that community programming um, and for example wise practice recommendations are best informed by the communities that they're trying to serve um, uh, so um, if that does go forward um, we would absolutely um, uh, you know, include Two Spirit um, and Digital Clear to SDLGBQ plus folks um, in that work, um, um, or and and um, uh, and in that consultation, um, and and uh, you know, uh, I think we really believe in uh, in 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 them leading that um, that that work and those wise practices, right? Thanks, Sarah. Um, we do have another question also about the availability of, of this work um, and where people might be able to find it if it's shared somewhere. Um, they're wondering if it's been shared with other sovereign nations. Um, and this person is from, from the US. So I think there might be a little bit of like an international piece of, involved in that question. Uh, okay, thanks for um, thanks for asking that question. Um, so the info sheets um, are were provided um, when you first uh, enter um, the platform. Um, they are uh, provide provided uh, in PDF format um, under the under the session um, before you enter uh, before you like press the button that says join. Um, so they are provided uh, in that way. And we've also posted them on our social media in the past, um, and they will be available on our new website. Um, and, uh, you know, if you email us at Ken, we could also um, send them to you that way. Um, if there was a more specific uh, question within that question in terms of like how to um, access like community readiness training or, um, an info sheets workshop. Um, you could email um, myself at promising uh, at uh, can.ca, um, uh, or you can also uh, um, sorry, you can also access our contact information on our website um, or on our social media too. Um, and if you ask a question about accessing uh, any of the resources or information that I talked about today, um, then it would be would be forwarded to um, uh, to myself or or someone would help you out with that. Awesome, thanks, Sarah. Um, we don't have any other questions um, in the forum or the Q and A currently. So if anybody has any. Uh, last questions that they'd like to add. I think the session's wrapping up in about seven minutes here. Uh, please do so now. Yeah, this is Albert. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, <clears throat> sexual health information. And it's only recently that um, um, Pat Nguance, who's an Ojibwe language specialist, published a book of 19 Ojibwe legends and these legends actually give us some insight into how information about you know gender role sexuality body parts was imparted to indigenous youth and you know the last you know 200 years has really been a time of uh, erasure of this knowledge uh, in that, you know, Western mainstream sexual health has taken over indigenous ways of transferring this knowledge. And so I think we're coming into an age where indigenous languages are used to trans sexual health knowledge, as well as these uh, stories or legends uh, that were developed uh, thousands of years ago, right? Uh, that were based on best practice or best knowledge from every generation going back you know, uh, hundreds of generations and that we have access today through the publication of our book. And I think if we could center, uh, you know, our approach more direct about sexual health, prevention of, you know, STIs, as opposed to, you know, couching it in sort of polite terms where the youth don't really know what we're talking about because it's so sanitized 
and not informative enough to tell them, you know, what prevention or awareness is and what are the situations. So, so I think we need to move in those directions in terms of working with our knowledge keepers and our specialists in the language to guide us in starting to share this knowledge uh, with, you know, the coming generations. And so um, I would encourage people to get Pat Nguanza's book and just see how these uh, stories were constructed and what information they were intended to impart, especially to a young audience. There, period. <laughs> Make it so. Make it so, Vanessa and uh, Sarah. <laughs> We're working on it. <laughs> <laughs> That's for Star Trek. All... That's for Star Trek. Make it so. <laughs> I know. I love Star Trek. <laughs> um, I was just talking with someone the other day about um, the episode in Voyager when Chakotay builds Janeway, Captain Janeway, a bathtub, and how that's like my dream life. Yeah. Anyways, <laughs> um, I thank you for sharing orders. that, Albert. Um, oh, Vanessa. Uh, yeah, okay. I was going to say, I would take a Star Pardon Trek me? direct order from the captain, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> get her Star Trek. We're going to get you a, yes. a flip phone. Absolutely. Yeah, Albert's our captain. <laughs> um, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, in Manitoba, we've started um, a, 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 a network called NISH, uh, New Indigenous Sexual Health um, Educators. Um, and uh, um, yeah, and uh, as a group who is who are bringing voice uh, and you know uh, and and putting our heads together to uh, to do some of the work that uh, that Albert that Albert talked about as well. Um, so that is exciting. Um, and Pat Ninguance's book is um, is is amazing um, and contains so many stories um, and wisdom. Uh, so uh, so thanks for sharing about that. Uh, Albert. I'd say I highly recommend the Kichi um, Wee Nug story. <laughs> you want to share what that means? I was just going to throw it out there and let people find out on their own. <laughs> the Kichi Wee Nug story from the okay. <laughs> Joe book. Uh, and if you live in Winnipeg, they are stalled at the Petro Madison gas bar gas station for $20. You can also order them in like bookstores, I'm sure, across Turtle Island, but I have cleaned out that bookstore at least two times, uh, that little gas bar thing. So I highly encourage, that's wonderful, wonderful stories. It's true, sometimes I go there looking for it and I'm like, oh, Vanessa must have got to them. <laughs> um, great, uh, are there any other questions? Check the live Q&A discussion forum. No, nothing. Um, awesome. I just noticed that there was a comment from uh, Wesley Kiwait um, earlier um, that said, what we do here in Regina is we have interagency meetings that involve all other agencies in the area. And we give out in detail what is happening in our communities. They are a real need, especially when you have a lot of supports. Um, so thanks for sharing that uh, wisdom, um, Wesley. Um, uh, yeah, thanks for sharing that wise practice that you uh, do in your community. Um, so I think if there's, uh, uh, I hope everybody got a chance to fill out the polls um, and the evaluation. Um, and um, I just wanna say, um, hi, hi, Kinanaskunitin. Thank you for being here with us today. Um, for uh, uh, Canadian Aboriginal AIDS Network um, uh, AAA, AAAW event. Um, we uh, are so excited uh, about all of the events happening this week. Um, and I just wanted to mention um, a couple of the other events happening this week. Tomorrow, um, we have uh, Rising Up, Women Sharing Teachings, Experience and Wisdom. Um, and then on, uh, and then we also have uh, the Two Spirit Day, um, uh, which will have panel and art uh, showcases. Um, and then on Saturday, um, 
Oh, and then on the weekend, we have uh, the Indigenous Re Research in HIV and CANS Leadership Presentation. Um, and then we also have the Walk With Me Harm Reduction Equals Learning. Um, and so I hope that you are all able to make it to some of the presentations. Um, and thanks everyone for coming today and sharing your, your uh, medicine and wisdom, um, CAN uh, and all of us pre presenters. Bye. Bye.